When the first two Continental Congresses met in 1774 and 1775, almost everyone was present there. All of the colonies had their representatives, and business went on as usual. There was, however, an empty spot. See, for both of these events, the organizers in the 13 colonies had invited the French Canadians of the former French-owned part of Canada, called Quebec. It had only been a decade ago that they had changed hands from France to Britain, and there was a good chance they would rise up against their new overlords. At least, that's what they hoped. The two letters were sent for the Canadians to join the revolt, but no responses ever arrived. When war broke out in 1775, the Canadian province of Quebec seemed like a prime target for the colonists to seize more land and harm any British attempts at reinforcing their position on the continent. They also still believed that the people there would open their arms to the American forces and would revolt against the British, joining the brand new nation. The stage was set for an invasion. With the capture of Fort Ticonderoga, the seat of British power in the northern reaches of North America was tenuous. Fort Ticonderoga had been a linchpin in the defense of the region, and past that, the rest of the area was lightly defended. The British governor of Quebec, Guy Carleton, recognized this and began to prep for an invasion. He began fortifying St. John's, which was a town and fort that guarded the approaches to Montreal. St. John's had been raided earlier by Benedict Arnold when he had captured Fort Ticonderoga, and so it took time to rebuild the defenses there. The entire province of Quebec at this time was only garrisoned by about 600 soldiers, and both knew that if a large-scale invasion was able to occur, the conquest of the region could happen swiftly. Holding St. John's was the key to success. 120 men were dispatched to the region. A small Canadian militia force of about 50 joined them there to garrison the town. At the same time, American General Philip Schuyler began to build up a force of over a thousand men to attack the fort and Montreal. What would end up being a tipping point in this conflict is who could gain the support of the Native Americans in the area. Both sides appealed to the Haudenosaunee Confederacy for support. The British were able to attain mild support and were promised supplies and intelligence. Some Native troops would even serve alongside the British Army during the campaign. The Americans were much less fortunate they extracted promises of neutrality as long as after the war there would be an agreement of sorts to figure out settlement on the lands of the Native Americans. There would be a few natives that would also serve alongside the Americans, but this was negligible. The British definitely won here. It should be noted here that the tribes that made up the Haudenosaunee were split on the issue. Some wanted to stay neutral, and some wanted to help the Americans, and some wanted to help the British. The rifts that started here would wear away at the unity of the Confederacy until it would eventually break apart. In late August, American Brigadier General Richard Montgomery marched north with 1,200 men to attack Fort St. John's. Schuyler had, by this time, fallen ill and had given over command of the campaign to Montgomery. He arrived and began sieging Fort St. John's on September 17th. The fort had been reinforced by many fresh men and the garrison was now well into the hundreds. The American army settled in for a siege. After about a month, the Americans were able to capture a small fort called Fort Chambly. The capture of this fort provided winter provisions and ammunition that was almost immediately turned around to hold off and force back a British relief attempt led by Governor Carleton. When this failed, the defenders of the fort became disheartened and surrendered on November 3rd. The gates to Montreal lay open. The Americans marched towards the city and were able to capture it without a fight on the 13th. The campaign almost ended then and there. While fleeing, Carleton's fleet was sailing to Quebec City on the river and was approached by a boat with a truce flag. It asked for the surrender because the Americans had placed cannons up the river and would destroy the convoy if they didn't. Carleton snuck off his ship and made his way to Quebec on his own. And when the fleet realized that the cannon placements were in fact real and not a bluff, they all surrendered to the Americans. The American forces released many captured soldiers that would further go on to augment their strength. 
Two Canadian regiments were also raised from the surrounding regions, and they would reinforce Montgomery's army. Montgomery then left General David Wooster in charge of Montreal with 200 men and sailed north towards Quebec City to finish his conquest. During the last episode, I mentioned how Benedict Arnold was also embarking on an invasion of Canada. You would also be correct in asking where he is right now. Well, I regret to inform you that I have no clue where he must... He's coming out of the woods. Benedict Arnold marched north from Boston in late September with his forces. Instead of joining up with the army already at Fort Ticonderoga, he marched his men through present-day Maine's uncharted and undeveloped wilderness. The overland travel took a heavy toll on his men. They lost tons of food, gunpowder, and other supplies, and got lost many times. By the time they arrived on the Plains of Abraham, right outside of Quebec City, Arnold had already lost 500 of his 1,100 men he set out with. Arnold and Montgomery met up and laid siege to the city. At this point, I want to stress how precarious Governor Carleton's position was and how monumental the next battle would be. Carleton was forced to give up most of the fortified Canadian land and had lost most of his competent officers and soldiers. He was running out of food, had no clue if or when reinforcements were going to arrive, and in the last bastion of British control in Canada, he sat there with a meager amount of food and a ragtag force that was made up of regular soldiers, officers, militia, and people that he can just grab off the side of the road and give them a gun. He also employed some Native Americans as scouts to gather intelligence on the American movements, but that was about it. On the other side, the American forces jointly commanded by Montgomery and Arnold knew that if they were to capture Quebec City, their mission was over. If this city fell, the colonies would have control over Quebec, and the British would be effectively driven off of the mainland of America, besides a few small holdouts. This would be a huge morale boost for them, and a massive hit to the enemy. They too were also racing against time. Arnold's men were battered and had run out of munitions. There was also an existential problem of enlistments running out. Many Americans were enlisted until January 1st the following year in 1776. The Americans would lose most of their forces if an attack was not launched soon. The planned attack was about to commence when suddenly a snowstorm hit on December 27th. And then an American soldier deserted and brought the current attack plans to the British guards in the city. This single act would have a major ripple effect on what was about to happen. Montgomery would have to go on to reformulate his plans, but this delayed the attack for several days until December 31st. On the night of the attack, a nor'easter blew in. A nor'easter, for those of you that don't know, is a powerful snowstorm akin to a hurricane or typhoon that hits the American East Coast during the wintertime on occasion. They are devastating last a long time, and will blanket large swaths of land in tons of snow. Remember that I said that most soldiers' enlistments would be up at the end of the year? Well, this fact is what forced Montgomery to attack literally on the last day of the year in such awful weather. As previously mentioned, this whole battle was incredibly important for the outcome of the war in Canada, and was a complicated and precarious situation for both sides. On the eve of the attack, Montgomery split his forces into two. He would lead a force to capture some of the outside palisades and would then attack through the southern part of the lower city. Arnold would take his men and attack the northern part of the lower city. There would also be some faint attacks to the far north in order to draw British troops away from the two main prongs. Both groups would meet up and then attack the walled-in upper city. What both men didn't know is that by this time, they were outnumbered and would be attacking heavily entrenched forces that were fighting for their lives. At 5 a.m. on December 31st, flares went up from the American positions and both sides attacked. Disaster occurred almost immediately. Montgomery found heavier British resistance than he believed. Undeterred, he instead unsheathed his sword and led a charge with his men towards the enemy position. 
What he did not know is that this position was actually a heavily fortified blockhouse that not only contained soldiers, but cannons. As he charged, a volley of musket and cannon fire rang out. Montgomery was killed immediately as he took a shot directly to the head. Many men were killed, including two senior officers that charged with him. There were two important men who survived this charge. Colonel Donald Campbell, who took command after the other officers were killed, and a man named Aaron Burr, who might, just maybe, have an impact on the course of American history later down the line. Campbell ordered his men to retreat and to no longer perform any more attacks. This part of the battle was finished, and this was a resounding defeat for the Continental Army. Arnold had similar problems. His forces entered the city and began fighting ferociously. Arnold was wounded in the leg from a musket ball and was forced to leave the battle. Command of his forces then fell onto Daniel Morgan. Morgan led an attack that ventured deep into the lower city. He captured a British position and pressed onwards, though the farther he went, the worse it became. Eventually, Carlton realized that the attacks on the northern gates were feints and redirected Captain George Laws to attack Morgan. Laws took his 500 men and surrounded him. Fierce fighting broke out, and the Americans were prevented from breaking out until eventually their ammunition ran out. By now, many of the soldiers felt defeated and knew they had lost. They surrendered en masse to the British soldiers, and their fight was over. To close out, the British forces attacked small fortified American positions outside the city, and then retreated back once it was done. Arnold, over the next few days, gathered his men outside the city and refused to retreat. He wrote to Wooster back in Montreal about marching north to reinforce him. Wooster wrote back that he could not, since his situation required all his troops to keep the peace in the city. We'll get back to this predicament in just a little bit. Arnold stubbornly laid siege to the city and requested reinforcements from Congress. By now, with over 400 men captured and many more returning home since their enlistments were finished, Arnold was left with about 600 men. He was outnumbered 3 to 1. His siege didn't really impact the city at all, and what reinforcements he did receive served only to plug his dwindling numbers. See, an outbreak of smallpox in his camp tore through his troops. Throughout the winter, not much would change. Arnold would be freezing in a smallpox-ridden camp while Carleton would continue to fortify Quebec City in case of another attack. By April, command of these forces near Quebec City were transferred to Wooster and then over to General John Thomas, a veteran from the Siege of Boston. He arrived and saw the effort was going nowhere and began to retreat towards Montreal. There wasn't much to retreat to. Over the last few months, Wooster had done exactly what he shouldn't have. He levied taxes on the locals without giving them representation in Congress. He procured goods and, importantly, was anti-Catholic. Remember how the people here were descendants of French settlers and the French were very Catholic? Yep, not a good look. Even a commission that had Benjamin Franklin in it arrived and could not halt the huge swing in public opinion. When news arrived of the impending American retreat, Hope of controlling the city became hopeless. All this time, Carleton stayed inside his walls, and the past commanders who had left the city were decisively defeated, and he didn't want this to be his fate. He waited until his reinforcements arrived. With an additional 200 fresh troops at his disposal, Carleton advanced, and what was at first an orderly retreat turned into a full-on rout. His Continental forces moved out of Montreal, and eventually all of them crossed back over into New York to occupy the Lake Champlain forts and Fort Ticonderoga. General Thomas died during this retreat from smallpox, which had broken out and was rampaging through all the American forces. Realizing that the British now had the manpower to attack into New York since they had now been reinforced by 9,000 soldiers, Arnold decided to do a series of delaying actions with the hope of holding out until winter hit. He commanded and lost a devastating naval battle at Valcour Island, where pretty much the entire Continental fleet was wiped out, and then did a tactical retreat, destroying the fortifications at Crown Point. When the British arrived there, they found nothing. He arrived at Fort Ticonderoga successful, though. He had prevented a full-scale British attack into New York. By early October, when this all occurred, 
snow had begun and the campaigning season was over. The Quebec campaign was done and it was a resounding defeat. While the idea of invading Quebec would persist throughout the war, American forces would never again enter the province, at least for the entirety of this war. The Quebec campaign was also the first defeat suffered by the Continental Army and was a wake-up call after their recent wins in Lexington and Concord, and at the Siege of Boston. Arnold had suffered some defeats, and also had won some major victories. His story is not over. For now, he stays at Fort Ticonderoga with his men for the winter. On the British side, Guy Carleton was criticized for losing so much territory and then being passive when he had the chance to seriously crush the American forces. He also received praise, though, for grabbing victory from the jaws of defeat. His story will also continue, though it should be noted that, along with the 9,000 reinforcements that arrived, also came John Burgoyne. Hmm. Remember him from the Siege of Boston? It would be his job, and not Carleton's, to recapture the Hudson Valley, once campaign season arrived in 1777. Among these 9,000 troops were a large attachment of German troops. These Hessians, as they would later be called, were used to augment the British forces with non-English soldiers, so it wouldn't be as big of a drain on manpower that was needed elsewhere. They will be important later in the war. As 1776 comes to a close in the northern theater of this war, the stage has been set for a titanic clash between men with ambition. The outcomes of these such battles will not only change the course of the war, but also the course of world history.